Hi, my name is Megan Weigel. I'm a doctor of nursing practice and an advanced practice registered nurse at First Coast Integrative Medicine in Jacksonville, Florida. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about incorporating integrative medicine modalities for pain into clinical practice. I'd like to thank the Aging and Integrative Pain Assessment and Management Initiative in collaboration with the Florida Blue Foundation for allowing this, uh, this series of presentations to come to life, and I am honored to be a part of the initiative. I am an advanced practice holistic nurse and a multiple sclerosis certified nurse. I started First Coast Integrative Medicine in 2019 in order to be able to provide more integrative care to people living with chronic neurological conditions and medically unexplained symptoms, which is where I have spent the majority of my career um, about 22 years as a nurse practitioner in neurology. In my practice, I use soul lightening acupressure as well as heart math biofeedback to complement uh, my integrative medicine services. And I'm a 200 hour certified yoga teacher. The objectives of this presentation are to define types of pain as well as the burden of pain, review conventional approaches to pain management, discuss areas of concern related to an integrative approach, and then outline that integrative approach to pain management. We will talk about lifestyle changes, supplements, manual therapies, and exercise therapies uh, that you can easily implement into a busy clinic day. What is pain? Well, the International Association for the Study of Pain defines it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So right away, we can see that uh, pain might be associated with a threat, and our response to pain might have more to do with the concern of a threat than actually the injury itself. It means that pain is always a personal experience. It's varied by many factors. Pain and nociception are different phenomena. Pain cannot be inferred solely from activity in sensory neurons. People learn the concept of pain through their life experiences, and a person's report of pain should be respected. Pain usually serves an adaptive role but it may have adverse effects on function and social and psychological well-being when it becomes chronic. Verbal description is only one of several behaviors that express pain, and the inability to communicate does not negate the possibility or the importance of pain. The most commonly described types of pain are nociceptive, which is caused by stimuli that threaten the body or result from tissue damage. Examples of this are post-surgical pain or trauma, but nociceptive pain can progress to chronic pain. Neuropathic pain is a result of damage or disease to the central or peripheral nervous system. It causes gain of function, which is pain, instead of or in addition to loss of function. So an example of this would be a person who describes numbness and tingling or hyperesthesia in a limb. Examples include trigeminal neuralgia, spinal cord injury, pain related to MS, phantom limb pain, and neuropathy. Central sensitization occurs when the central nervous system becomes hyperactive or hyperreactive. Pain symptoms continue inappropriately after the insult, and actually localized pain can become a generalized pain disorder, moving from acute to chronic pain. Evidence now suggests that activated microglia in the central nervous system cause neuroinflammation that can actually promote central sensitization. And examples include fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndrome, dysregulated responses associated with irritable bowel syndrome, restless leg syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, interstitial cystitis, and even major depressive disorder. 
The issue is in the tissues. Some of you may have heard this phrase. Um, it usually, uh, well, I should say it probably originally originates from massage therapy or even from osteopathy or chiropractic work. So the issue is in the tissues with pain, but it can also be in the home, in the heart, or in the family because our perception of pain is uh, affected by genetics, by epigenetics, by our nutrient status, by our history of mental health issues, by trauma, and the list goes on and on. When we as providers think about those things, it can be overwhelming because we aren't all pain management experts, but we can all become experts in giving gold nuggets to people suffering from pain. And I hope that you leave listening to this presentation today with some of those gold nuggets. Pain has a tremendous effect on our society. About 20% of American adults report chronic pain and about 8 million of those report it as high impact. The U.S. uses 80% of manufactured opiates in the world. In 2010, the estimated direct and indirect costs of pain were over $560 billion, uh, so we can for sure uh, estimate that the cost is higher uh, in today's um, financial marketplace. My pain isn't the same as your pain, and the problem is we use the same algorithms to treat pain. Non-pharmacologic integrative therapies are now recommended in conventional pain management guidelines, which is incredible and very beneficial to patients and I think also to healthcare providers. However, these therapies are poorly reimbursed and that's something that um, we as a medical community need to work on in order to provide the best care to patients. So the usual path to pain management includes taking an excellent history that includes pain assessment, uh, documenting an excellent physical exam, and ordering appropriate diagnostic testing. And then yes, we recommend non-pharmacological therapies. We recommend physical therapy, exercise, mental health therapies, mind-body therapies, even energy medicine, acupuncture, uh, chiropractic work, TENS, and laser therapies are listed in current uh, guidelines for pain management. But here's the problem. A patient may come to you and say, well, doc, how can Reiki help me? And you might say in your head, what the heck is Reiki? <laughs> and if you know what Reiki is, um, explaining it in terms, uh, in intelligent terms uh, that are, are limited by time is difficult. Um, and so, you know, so, so incorporating these things into a conventional visit uh, during which you might have 15 to 20 minutes to address everything with a patient, including their urine tox screen, um, is, is a little overwhelming. Uh, we also recommend pharmacologic therapies. We go from topicals to acetaminophen or NSAIDs to antidepressants or antiepileptics that have um, scientific evidence that they help with pain to opiates to medical cannabis. We move to pain rehabilitation therapies for people with refractory pain. And somewhere uh, sprinkled in uh, all of these interventions, uh, we might use uh, or refer for interventional therapies uh, like injection, injection therapies. The integrative approach brings in the lifestyle changes, the nutraceuticals and botanicals, the manual and alternative therapies, and the exercise therapies uh, to help manage pain. Integrative medicine is a healing-oriented medicine that takes account of the whole person, including all aspects of lifestyle. It emphasizes the therapeutic relationship between the practitioner and patient and is informed by evidence, making use of all appropriate therapies. It also focuses on the least invasive, least toxic, and least costly methods to help facilitate health by integrating both allopath allopathic and complementary therapies. These therapies are recommended based on an understanding of the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of the individual, and integrative medicine maintains that healing is always possible, even when curing is not. 
common concerns about using integrative medicine modalities include the level of evidence for that modality and the reality is if there is any evidence. Um, it, and, and I can tell you that there is usually evidence for most therapies, uh, but it may be low level. The study may be small. The study design may be poor. Um, part of the reason behind that is because there's little money to, um, uh, to fund large studies for integrative medicine therapies. But you can review the literature. You can consider cases on an individual basis, and you can make a very, uh, a very good estimate of risk to harm ratio when recommending a therapy. When you're thinking about harm, we're usually thinking about disease and intervention, or intervention. When you're thinking about harm, you're thinking about um, harm between a, a disease and an intervention. And an, um, an example might be hypnosis. Um, hypnosis for a person who has a history of PTSD uh, might not be the best therapy. But we also have to look at drug supplement interactions and supplement supplement interactions. Uh, supplements are metabolized by the same cytochrome P450 system as our drugs. Most common concerns are antiplatelets, anticoagulants, and antidepressant interactions. Um, you also need to consider choosing good sources of supplements, those that have the USP label or consumer lab or NSF certification. You want to choose supplements that are manufactured in the USA by a reputable uh, manufacturer. Uh, it has been shown that supplements manufactured in China or India are more likely to be adulterated with heavy metals or even medications. Another concern about eye integrative medicine usage comes from the patient, and that is just that the provider doesn't know the answer, so the, bla the blanket recommendation is no. Um, and you can definitely serve your patients well by compiling a list of reputable referrals, uh, reputable referral sources for the services that you're asked about the most. You can check certification and licensure status of providers to whom you refer and keep a handy list for patients when they ask. As I mentioned previously, research in CAM complementary and alternative modalities is difficult for several reasons. I mentioned some of those reasons. One of the reasons I did not mention is that a lot of claims are made about CAM modalities that have no backup. And you can find a video of just about anything on the internet these days that claims a person was cured by X, Y, or Z. There are also many people practicing integrative medicine without proper training who aren't even licensed healthcare providers. So how do you know what to advise patients? Um, this is my suggested algorithm. First of all, is there evidence that what you're recommending or what the patient is asking about is helpful? And if there is evidence that it's helpful, does the evidence outweigh the risk, including the risk of financial harm? If there is no evidence and the patient wants to try it anyway, because that's just his or her druthers, is it harmful or costly? And if it can't be, recommend, can't be recommended because of any one of those things, is there something else that you can give to the patient that may meet his or her needs? And finally, no matter what decision you come to, does the patient have realistic expectations about what to expect from that therapy? And that's perhaps the most important one. So Dr. Wayne Jonas uh, is a physician who has been instrumental in um, making integrative medical care more mainstream. And I would encourage you to check out his website, drwaynejonas.com. I would also encourage you to consider ditching the soap note every once in a while and trying a hope note. A hope note is what Dr. Wayne Jonas refers to as healing-oriented practices and environments that you address with patients. And uh, these hope components include behavior and lifestyle, um, and that speaks to um, sleep, food, um, the environment, which is extremely important. Does a, does a person feel safe and comfortable in their environment? 
what are that po person's social and emotional resources? And what is the shape of that person's mind and spirit? So let's move to some direct inter integrative medicine recommendations. The first one is in the category of lifestyle changes, and it just begins with food. Pain alters eating behavior, and many of you listening can probably remember a time that you were in pain and you sought out some sort of comfort food, or a time that you were in so much pain that you just couldn't eat. Um, imagine that this is happening to people all day long on a daily basis. Uh, diets high in inflammatory foods worsen pain. Obesity worsens pain. Don't make things too complicated with patients. What we're trying to do here is give gold nuggets. So encourage small steps. Michael Pollan says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. You can have a quick conversation with patients about getting rid of soda and other sugar-sweetened beverages, processed sugars, fat, fast foods, and processed snacks and just bringing in more whole, real food, colorful fruits and veggies, foods that are high in omega-3s. And you can give this information without getting bogged down into too many details. Also in the lifestyle category are mind-body therapies. And mind-body therapies are really considered super therapies because they address not just pain, but also comorbidities associated with pain. They address sleep, mood, eating behaviors, and cognitive issues. One of these is guided imagery. Guided imagery is also known as the lazy man's meditation, and it's considered this because a person can be listening to guided imagery and fall asleep and still have the same benefits as if they were to be awake. And that is not the case with meditation. <laughs> Guided imagery does actually change the brain's circuitry um, where it's implicated in anxiety. Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the healthcare systems on the West Coast, has a lovely library of free guided imagery that is based on uh, wellness and also diseases and conditions uh, that you can refer patients to online. One of the most studied techniques in mindfulness is mindfulness-based stress reduction. Dr. John Kabat-Zinn is the founder of MBSR, and in particular, this program um, helps with pain and pain comorbidities, such as anxiety. Biofeedback has also been proven to be helpful for fibromyalgia, migraine, and other painful conditions, and there are many different types of biofeedback. Perhaps the one we're most familiar with is heart rate variability or even just um, uh, pulse variability, but neurofeedback is another uh, type of feedback that's more up and coming and found to be quite helpful. I personally, in my practice, place a strong emphasis on the mind, body, and spirit. I'm going to move through this list of affirmations from a book called You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay, who was a motivational speaker, a healer, uh, and a theologian. Um, she founded Hay House Publishing, which is a publishing house through which many integrative providers publish their work. And through her work with people, um, she came to recognize patterns. These affirmations uh, can be given to patients, and um, they may or may not resonate. And if they resonate, you may see... Uh, almost a catch in a person's emotion, like, oh, wow, how did you know that about me? So for neck pain, an affirmation is there are endless ways of doing and seeing things. I am safe. For low back pain, I trust the process of life. I am safe. For headache, I see myself and what I do with eyes of love. I am safe. For hip pain, I am in perfect balance. I move forward in life with ease and joy. For neuropathic pain, I forgive myself. I communicate with love. 
For leg pain, I move forward with confidence and joy, all is well. For shoulder pain, I choose to allow all my experiences to be joyous and loving. Keeping a copy of this book around your clinic or around your exam room um, might be a tool, uh, a, a, a nice um, mind, body, spirit tool to keep on hand and use with patients. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we move into a case. So supplements. I rely on supplements with some caution. We know that optimizing a diet helps optimize supplements. And sometimes when a person healthies up their diet and takes out things that are very harmful and offer no nutritional value, they don't need any supplements. Um, and certainly optimizing diet and the way a body functions will help people use supplements better. If you think it's necessary, checking in uh, red blood cell magnesium, also B vitamins and vitamin D 25 hydroxy can provide you with evidence to supplement if a person is deficient or insufficient in any of these nutrients. In particular, um, I like to speak of vitamin B12 because the reference range is that over 200 is considered to be normal. Uh, but actually, when a person has a level under 400, they can have neurological or neuropsychological symptoms. So if a person um, has pain and depression and brain fog and their B vitamin level is 350, I would say that's not good enough. Studies do suggest improvement in pain for these nutrients. Um, magnesium B vitamins and vitamin D3, as well as omega-3s in doses between 1,000 and 3,000 milligrams a day, of course, uh, barring any medication or disease interactions with these supplements. As I mentioned before, the most common one, particularly for omega-3s, would be antiplatelets and anticoagulants. Other helpful supplements that I'll make as blanket recommendations for pain are curcumin at doses of 500 to 1500 milligrams per day, depending on tolerability. And that tolerability would usually relate to GI side effects. Also ASU or avocado soybean unsaponifiables. These may actually reduce the need for NSAIDs after four to six weeks of use. And other blanket recommended supplements would be cannabis or CBD. Um, that in and of itself is a presentation that should probably be several hours, if not days long, um, and has already been discussed in, um, in previous efforts uh, for this intervention for integrative pain management um, through uh, PAMI and UF. Manual therapies uh, include energy medicine, acupuncture, acupressure, massage, and chiropractic work. Energy medicine focuses on releasing blocks of energy, and that energy is what's referred to as qi in Chinese medicine, uh, sometimes the subtle body in other forms of medicine. And examples of this include Reiki, healing touch, homeopathy, prayer, sound and light therapy, yoga, zero balancing, and therapeutic touch. Many practitioners of acupuncture, acupressure, and massage also see their work as energetic work. In acupuncture, the research is, is, is biased. The largest meta-analysis uh, drawing from individual patient data does show benefit for back, neck, and shoulder pain, as well as osteoarthritis and headache. Um, and acupuncture is not usually harmful unless it's very expensive or unless a person, of course, has a significant fear of needles. Acupressure applies light touch or pressure to points on traditional Chinese medicine meridians. Acupressure might be more helpful for a person who is very sensitive to, to even light touch, whereas massage and acupuncture may cause too much pain. Many manual techniques fall under the umbrella of massage. 
common ones that you may be familiar with are myofascial release, cranial sacral therapy, and strain counter strain techniques, which come from osteopathy. And then chiropractic work. Um, chiropractors have subspecialties just as medical doctors, DOs, and uh, mid-level providers do. So I would encourage you to get to know chiropractors in your community that um, specialize in different types of pain treatment. Exercise therapies include physical therapy, which often helps people get started with exercise safely and confidently. Um, many people don't have any body awareness. And then when you throw uh, pain into lack of body awareness, uh, fear um, really uh, rises up. And starting with physical therapy is an excellent place to help get rid of, of that um, and help people learn to move their bodies safely. I think the next step would be something like exercise training, which is not usually covered by insurance, although some insurance companies do cover a gym membership. And exercise training, working with an exercise uh, physiologist or an exercise specialist personal trainer, helps people going and helps them to continue to progress towards their goals and in their function. And another exercise therapy that has been well-researched is Tai Chi, and systematic reviews show benefit for chronic pain, osteoarthritis, back pain, headache, and fibromyalgia. So let's give you some of those gold nuggets so that you can pass them on to patients. This is a very general case. Uh, you have an overweight patient who's eating a standard American diet. They have chronic low back pain with radicular pain. Uh, the person has depression and insomnia. The person currently takes gabapentin and celecoxib daily. They take tizanidine as needed for muscle spasm or frankly if they just can't get to sleep because it helps them with sleep. And they say to you, doc, I don't want more meds. How can I get better? So your gold nuggets, uh, well, you take a look at the lifestyle of that person and they're eating a poor, uh, a poor standard American diet with little nutritional value. And you say, can you add colorful fruits and veggies into each meal of every day? That may look like uh, some berries, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, very high in phytonutrients with breakfast. That may look like a green salad with lunch, and that may look like choosing um, uh, broccoli or cauliflower instead of french fries with dinner. And can you stop soda? Can you try those things 80-20 for about two weeks? You could also safely recommend magnesium at bedtime for sleep and to help with muscle tension. You could recommend guided imagery at night before bed, again, to help that person get ready for sleep. And you can take a look at those affirmations in the book, You Can Heal Your Life. And when you look at low back pain, you can just say to that person, you know, how does it feel when you say, I know that life supports me? And you can tell that person that you want them to write that down on a little sticky note or maybe do it for them and put that on their bathroom mirror so that they can see it every day. And then you have them come back for follow-up in two weeks, and you see how they're doing. Those are some gold nuggets for treating pain. Even the chronic pain patient may not have heard those things before, or they might not have heard them delivered in an easy and empowered manner. I'd like to leave you with this quote. A cure is a medical procedure that reliably helps you recover from illness. Healing is an inner process through which the human organism seeks its own recovery physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I'd like to encourage you as healthcare providers to guide the human beings that you see towards that physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing by giving them resources that they can use to feel empowered and improve their quality of life even if they have to live with pain. Thank you so much.